great one for you today. We have fan favorite Colonel Doug McGregor with us today. A uh, great way to start the new year and love to have you on the show, Doug. Welcome back. Yeah, sure. How are you? And happy new year. You know, I'm, I'm doing all right. A uh, lot, a lot of things to discuss here and a lot of things to cover. And man, there's nobody better than you to talk about some of these, especially things on the strategic level, which is why we're so grateful to have you on there. But before we dive into what we're going to talk about today, which is by the way, uh, what is the prospect for life uh, with the West after the war is over with Russia? Because no matter what, Russia is still going to be there and we're going to have to deal with them. But we're going to set the stage for some of that to, so people can understand why those questions are so important. But as we do, we're going to talk about some of the things that are on the battlefield in the Ukraine, how that war has been going. And, and I just want people to know, because I know that some people have some knowledge of your background, but I think that few people realize just how much combat experience and directly related to what we're talking about you've had. So we want people to see this short clip of a documentary that was once made about you. It got to the point sort of late morning, early afternoon, where you couldn't see more than perhaps... Uh, 20, 30 yards. All of a sudden, we're about to go into combat against the one real enemy that we had practiced to defeat, and suddenly our visibility is terrible. To the right, and I saw what looked like explosions to the left uh, front of uh, McMaster's tank, and I couldn't tell if these were mines uh, or artillery fire again. And my gunner, uh, Dewey Jones, pipes up and says, holy sh look at this. And I dropped down inside. I looked through my commander's sight and I said, oh yeah, I, you know, I was <laughs> finally impressed with the enemy. Here were, you know, rows, literally 10, 15 tanks spread right across to the front. And you could see that these tank guns were moving. And I imagine since these were manual T-72s, the poor Republican guard was in there <laughs> busily cranking to get the guns around towards us. Then all of a sudden, my tank went into a minefield. And this thing rocked the 70 ton tank a fireball went over it knocked me down to the turret floor and uh fortunately my driver was very tough-minded so what the hell was that and i said don't worry about it keep driving as we were coming out of the minefield we had a couple of tanks to our front it was sure i got tanks to my front and i'm looking at the damn tank that we're about to take under fire and the gunner has stayed Sir, can I shoot? Can I fire? I said, for God's sake, shoot! We swung to the next one and fired. And in the meantime, I could see that Eagle Troop was taking uh, enormous numbers of vehicles under fire. Now, folks, I can tell you, I was behind Doug when this was all going on there in real life. And, and as exciting as that was to watch, I can assure you it was nothing compared to what it was to be there. And and it was depicted on there. You may think, OK, he was like the basically the second in command and certainly the on the ground commander of the whole squadron going into that combat. And you're like that one tank wouldn't be the first one in there. But he was, you were, the, in fact, you were in front of the lead scouts of, of Eagle Troop there for one part of that battle. And I always wondered how you survived that. It must have been the hand of God on you. Well, I think I was younger and dumber then. In fact, if I go back and look at that, I, what, what was I, 25 or something? <laughs> Good God, that, that seems so long ago now that it's hard yeah. to imagine. But that was a nice, uh, a nice trip back in, in time to see what we went through and, uh, I'm always uh, humbled by the performance of the soldiers. I mean, they, yeah. they were spectacular. They knew what to do, and they did it with very little instruction. But they had good leadership. We were all out front. All the leaders were out front, and uh, that's where you have to be. Uh, if you're not there, you're making a terrible mistake. Yeah, and, and it all goes back to the all of the months and years, in most cases, of training we did before we ever got to that battle. And I think that's 
one of the biggest reasons for our success. And I think one of the biggest reasons for the lack of success, especially in the Ukrainian army, because they didn't have the benefit that we had of years of, you know, exceptional training and, and development of leaders at every level that before they got into the battle, which you talk about, of course, in your one of your books, uh, you know, at length about how you build combat power. And uh, it's just like they just almost have started from from a chance to, or a position where they just almost can't have success against a, a very large army in the Russian side. I think that's a big part of it. Well, Americans are uh, have a sort of shake and bake mentality. In other words, if we sh sprinkle enough money and technology on a group of people, miraculously, they will all become effective and suddenly uh, be a, a world beating force. That's always nonsense. And the human factor is still decisive. And I don't care what anybody says. I hear all the time about, well, this new technology will change everything. Well, every new piece of technology has an impact and you have to adjust for it. You adjust in organization, leadership, tactics. But the people who do the best job of adjusting, and you know this from your experience, Dan, are soldiers. And if you want to find out what something new can do, you've got to put it in the hands of soldiers who are experienced and know what they're doing. And they'll find out for you just what needs to be done. We never do that. We have some general at, at, at a remote location pontificating based on his decades of peacetime service, how something should be done. And you've got all sorts of competent non-commissioned officers and soldiers who've seen some action and will look at you like, you know, you're crazy. That's not going to work. You need to do X, Y, and Z. No one will listen to them. That's our big, our, it's our big problem right now across the boards in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, and the Marines. Man, I, I lived that in, in the mid-2000s in the future combat systems. I'll never forget that all of the combat experience guys from Desert Storm and elsewhere were on the line. And, at, you know, at, at the NUG level where all this training and stuff was going on. And then at the general officer level, they were worried about making these videos, you know, uh, like CG videos, like movie scenes, and they would literally script out movies. This is the way we would like it to be. And all of us on the ground are saying, dude, that's not working. It doesn't work like that. And it's like, no, nah, blah, 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 not going to listen. And then they made more videos. And of course, Congress is just shoveling the cash into it based on the videos. Well, uh, the problem on the Hill, of course, is that as long as they get to shovel the cash, they benefit from the cash shoveling. And so they're not terribly concerned uh, what happens to it. Look look what happened with the future combat system. What we spent at what, at least a billion dollars or more, and we got nothing for it. However, if you go, yeah, uh, but if you go to the uh, uh, Hill, they'll say, oh, yeah, no, that was a big success. Why? Well, we spent it. So the money went to our constituents. Who are your constituents and donors? Well, we know who they are. They're in the defense industries. And in addition to that, uh, we made uh, our biggest donors happy because we were sustaining the, the great instrument of American military power. You try to tell them, well, money in doesn't equal capability out. Nobody cares. And that's where we are now. And the Russians, as we've seen repeatedly, understand that. They've made adjustments. They've done what is necessary to be successful. And they haven't worried terribly about, well, what does this look like? And so a lot of people are confused because they see you know, designated third guards tank army. Well, it's not a tank army. It, it's a it's an honorary, you know, title that is conferred on a particular unit. And what you have under that tank army is very different from what you would have seen decades ago. Well, that's a good thing. They're smart. They figured this out and they figured out how to integrate and augment their capabilities with new technology very, very quickly. And, you know, and I think, Doug, one, one of the differences between what Russia is now and, and where we are now is that I think at the beginning of this war, I think that there was lots of corruption and, and enduring problems within the Russian military that were that were covered over and were hidden. And they did a lot of this fiction just like our guys did, but it was all exposed in the early phases and in the, in the, maybe even the first year when a lot of that dross was burned off. And now then the reality is set in and you see they are actually making these kinds of changes, which can have an impact on the battlefield. And we're still in the fiction phase. Now, that tails in directly with with what we want to talk about today, because we haven't had that stuff all burned off yet because all those leaders are still there. And let's just take a look at it at a couple of them here, because here's where we're going with this. 
we are going to have to deal with Russia after this is over. Everybody wants to just talk about in the West, Putin can't win. We're going to defeat him. Russia, Ukraine's going to win all this stuff, but no one's saying what is going to be the end state. You talk about this all the time. What is your objective? Where's the end state that you seek here? We don't talk about that, but it's time. We are now forced to talk about what is going to be the end state. Here is what some of our Western leaders were saying. Uh, let's see. The first one is Ursula von der Leyen. Um, I, I believe this was fairly early in the war where she said, we are backing them all the way. You're sitting there with all the leaders. Can you tell me genuinely from the bottom of your heart that there is no fatigue amongst the West, that there's no concerns about this path that you're all embarked on? Absolutely. As long as it takes, we will support Ukraine because Ukraine is not only fighting for itself, the integrity and sovereignty of the country, but it is fighting for all democracies. All democracies. Yeah. So we are as long as it takes a half a year later, after there had been some Ukrainian success in Kharkiv and Kherson provinces, uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg went on to re-emphasize that we are in this for the long haul. We cannot let Putin win. This would show authoritarian leaders around the world that they can achieve their goals by using military force. Now, you might could say, OK, well, he was buoyed by some success because they actually did have some tactical success there on the Ukraine side. So he wanted to do on that. But then from that moment, a full year later, after all of this, you know, much hyped uh, offensive, the summer offensive of the Ukraine absolutely ground to, to dust and didn't go anywhere at all. You had the leader of Germany, Schultz, still saying something like this. Changing borders by force should not be part of the reality of Europe anymore. And with the aggression against Ukraine, the Russian leader decided to change this agreement to fight against another country and just to try to get its territory to be Russian. And we cannot accept this. And we have to react to this Zeitung Wende. And that means supporting Ukraine in defending the own country. Putin must not win. So he's still talking aspirational. We don't want Putin to win, so he must not. But as he said in the first part of that, he said something about the reality on the ground in Europe. Well, here is the reality on the ground in Europe. This report from 1 January. Сегодня в ночи снова Киев, у Киева за вдан был удар комбинованный шахедами, крылатыми ракетами, гиперзвуковыми ракетами Кинжал. Мы находимся сейчас в Соломинском районе, где бачимо великий кратер. And on the point of reality and what this means going forward, all the stuff we've seen over the last one year of con uh, conflict where Ukraine didn't have success, even though we gave them everything in the world that we could have that should have given them some chance but didn't. Now then, with this new missile barrage that has gone on, CNN had a report yesterday uh, that talked about what the prospect for the future looks like. Vladimir Putin said moments ago that Russia will increase its airstrikes on Ukraine in the coming days, weeks and months. As we look at this, you know, the airstrikes in Odessa, but we've seen them in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, all the way over here in Lviv, also in central Ukraine, in Zaporizhia, other regions. How long could Russia keep this up for, Cedric? I do think that we have underestimated the capacity of the Russians to withstand this. Uh, we have to look at there's about an 800 percent increase in the trade in certain materials between China and Russia. And that material is predominantly war material that has been shipped into Russia from from China and also North Korea. So the Russians can sustain this for some time. So now, Doug, what he said in that last part there, I think, is instructive about what we could hope for going forward. And what we're going to have to deal with is that we tried to strangle Russia from the beginning. We tried to say, you know, from the outset that we're going to destroy their economy and, and make them collapse and all this. But now that Russia, after some some trouble, I think, in the beginning, has has shifted now to the east 
And so there doesn't appear to be any prospect that uh, that they're going to collapse at all. In fact, they're growing stronger economically. So we, our hope to strangle and defeat Russia appears to me to be a complete dead issue. And this, even hours before we came on here today, there were four waves of, of missile launches uh, that it looks like that Russia's industrial capacity has indeed cranked up. And I, I doubt that we're going to see the end of this because that was the, the biggest one of the war on, on, on January 1st. And the one this morning was bigger than that. So what does that tell you about the, the prospects uh, of this war ending? And, and what, it, what about the United States? Where are we going to go with this? <clears throat> well, that's a good set of questions. Let's see how we do. Uh, I, I want to make a few points right up front. <clears throat> I'm sure some of your viewers have seen this film called Undergang, uh, it was called Downfall with Bruno Gantz, who's unfortunately passed away, and he plays Otto Hitler. And it shows you the last days in the bunker. And there's this marvelous scene just before Hitler walks into his apartment and shoots himself, where a couple of women standing in the hallway uh, say, but mein Führer, what about the inevitable victory? Uh, you know, they, this is what the Nazis kept talking about all through the war, the inevitable victory, the inevitable victory. And he sort of scoffs at the walks to the door, goes inside and shoots himself. Well, I have a feeling that uh, that that pretty well sums up where the West stands at this point. Uh, we're in the bunker. Everything has failed. We have nowhere to go. Now, the second thing is, and this is something that was said to me 50 years ago by a veteran of the Eastern Front. He said, you know, Doug, when you have no strategy, you end up in Stalingrad. Well, we've never had a strategy, no strategy at all. What we've been dealing with is emotion. Oh, Russians are bad. They must be punished. No one cared to look at the real issues at stake. No one read any of the Russian proposals. No one took the Russians seriously for 10, 15 years when they continuously pointed to the unacceptable nature of Ukraine as a platform for attack against Russia. They will not tolerate NATO on their borders. They made that very clear. <clears throat> we ignored all that. So there was no strategy. There was nobody that sat down and said, well, what do we want to do? Well, we want to destroy Russia. Well, is that even a reasonable objective? As, you know, this is an enormous country. It has almost limitless natural resources. It has a huge population. Uh, secondly, how do you isolate Russia? If you go back to 1990 and 91 and the run up to the first Gulf War, when you still had a few people with common sense in charge, uh, we had done an enormous uh, amount of work to isolate Iraq, to ensure that when we went after Iraq, there were, there were no allies. There was nowhere to turn. That Iraq was essentially boxed in. That was an impossibility with Russia. It sits next to almost the largest economy in the world. And then beyond that, you have India, another more than a billion Indians who are willing to trade and work with Russia. And beyond that, there are many others. So the notion that you could isolate was ridiculous. So you can't isolate it. You can't destroy it unless you want to risk a nuclear holocaust. And I don't see any evidence that anybody wants to do that. So then, what, oh, that so then what is the end state? And how do you propose to achieve it? Well, the end state was, well, we win and Russia loses and Russia is weakened and can never attack anybody again. Well, good luck with that. Just based on the first two observations, that's an impossibility. There was never a strategy. Yeah. And you heard, uh, you heard the statement, well, we probably underestimated the Russians from this man on CNN. I mean, all of his stuff has been awful. All of these people in the mainstream have been dead wrong about everything. They never studied the enemy. They never studied the, you know, who they were fighting and why. Not that I don't like to use the word enemy because I've never seen any evidence that Russia was an enemy of the United States. I think we've done a brilliant job of transforming them to one, into one, yeah. be an enemy for decades. But the point is they didn't study it. They didn't understand what they were dealing with. And they always forgot the, the salient point. How do you defeat a major power on the doorstep of the major power? I mean, we're six, 7,000 miles away, and we plan to wage war. Oh, well, we'll use our allies. Well, our allies are spineless vassals of the greater American empire. They have almost no capacity to contribute. They're, they're worn out, and they were worn out and exhausted in the space of a year. They no longer have much to send. So th the whole idea was there was never a strategy. It was a wish list, you know, born in someone's yeah. brain, if you want to call it that, in Washington, that bore no resemblance to reality. And everyone emoted, emoted, emoted. Oh, we've got to win. We've got to win. Okay. But 
It's never going to happen. Well, let me give you a perfect example of that. As a matter of fact, we just happen to have this queued up here. Uh, this is what Lindsey Graham is, is, had, had said earlier in the prospect or earlier in the war as why we had to win and what was at stake here. Uh, I think this is a little bit of nonsense, as you might come to the conclusion of, but this is what is passing for intelligence in Washington, and people are listening to this. Play that clip, Gary. To the American people, we are right to help the Ukrainian people in their quest for their freedom. If Ukraine falls to Putin, it will set in motion dire consequences for us as a nation. China will get the signal that they can take Taiwan. The Iranians will believe that we have no will to stop their nuclear ambitions. The converse is true. If the Chinese see the world rally around Ukraine and the rule of law being applied to Putin's war crimes, maybe they won't go into Taiwan. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that if China sees the rule of law, they'll certainly be back down immediately. That's nonsense. But unfortunately, that was early. Didn't stop. Here is Ben Hodges. Just days ago, that beacon of intellectual capacity added this. They have proven the concept that Crimea, the most important piece of terrain that Russia occupies inside Ukraine, can be made untenable for Russian forces if Ukraine has the weapons with the range and precision, like Storm Shadow, which is why it's just maddening to me. And, and I can't un cannot understand why my country and Germany both continue to uh, withhold providing ATACMs or the German Taurus, for example, that would allow Ukraine to go after Russian bases inside occupied Ukraine. Is he right, Doug? Would a few more storm shadows or, or ATACMs have tilted the war, and that's the only thing that's kept Ukraine from winning? Uh, I kind of like his jumpsuit. Did you th think that was a nice... Uh touch uh, <laughs> as though he just arrived from the gym in time to give this uh, entire entire extraordinarily interesting uh, interview look we're back to what we were talking about before well add this new technology add this new thing to the arsenal it'll be a game changer that's nonsense we all know that's nonsense no one technology is going to change anything secondly uh you know this is another manifestation of something else uh, we have a solution to our problems here in the West, and that is that we just don't tell the truth. We ignore reality. We in the West, particularly the English-speaking countries, but the West in general, is on the verge of bankruptcy. Our financial system is in serious trouble. We have printed ourselves into oblivion. No one will admit that publicly, but all you have to do is go dig deep and find everyone from Nassim Talib to Alastair McLeod to James Ricards to any number of Competent people have been watching this, and they'll tell you, we we are within sight of Armageddon financially. So whatever these people say, whatever they promise is an impossibility because financial Armageddon is coming. Even now, people will admit, yeah, I guess we're going to go into a recession. We're going to go into a very deep recession. It could look like a depression. Those things are real. Our, our industrial base is weak. We have no surge capacity. We cannot rapidly turn out missiles, equipment, and artillery. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians are in such poor shape right now. We know about the dragging pregnant women and 75-year-old men into uniform and 14 and 12-year-old boys. We know all about that. But right now, they sit in these defensive positions until they're overwhelmed, and they can't move because if they stick their heads out of these uh, entrenched uh, positions, uh, a drone overhead spots them, drops something on them, uh, artillery is 24 hours a day, seven days a week on call. Yeah. They, they can't match any of it. The only thing they can do is die in place. And I'm sure you remember when we were in, in the service, people would look at something and soldiers are never stupid. We, we give them a, an, a, I wouldn't, but we were sometimes ordered to defend something. And the soldier would look at that intelligently and say, well, that's stupid. That's a die in place mission. We used to call it a dip mission. Well, that's what we've done with the Ukrainians. We've given them Mission Impossible, and we've told them to die there. I don't like call, I don't like this reference to the Ukrainian people because I think the Ukrainian people have had enough. What we're dealing with is this criminal regime in Kiev, and they are dishonest, they're corrupt, they're duplicitous, and at some point we're going to watch what happened in Afghanistan happen in Kiev. And when that well, does, everyone yeah. is just going to walk away from it. Well, Doug, I'm, I'm almost afraid to show this. 
I'm almost afraid to show this because it's it's kind of man the manifestation of what you said just a couple of minutes ago about the the whole Führer bunker issue because this is exactly what I thought of when I saw this. I thank all our partners for the fact that this year we already have patriots, Iris T, Heimers, Nasons, Hawk, Abrams, Leopards, and many more. And our pilots are already mustering F-16 jets, and we will be definitely seeing them in our skies, so that our enemy can certainly see what our real ROS is. And next year the enemy will feel the ROS of domestic production. Our weapons, our equipment, our artillery, our shells, our drones, our naval greetings to the enemy, and at least a million Ukrainian FPV drones. That, I mean, that ties into what you said about this belief that just more technology and bam, it's going to be it's going to be one. And Zelensky, no matter all of these military battlefield setbacks and all the fact that they're now retreating and, in, in, you know, in incremental areas all over the front, man, just a few more productions and the whole thing's going to turn around. What, what do you think when you see something like that? Washington, D.C. and the people in it who govern us are untethered from reality. That is also true for Zelensky in Kiev. They are simply untethered from reality. We, we find that hard to believe and to accept. We want to think that the people in Washington are somehow or another smarter or more grounded. They are not. And for them, truth is irrelevant as long as they themselves are not threatened. Now, this is, this is the problem. If you're watching this from Moscow, you have to understand something that from the beginning of this operation, Putin was actually very restrained. You'll recall that as soon as it looked like there might be a breakthrough in talks at the end of March, beginning of April last year, uh, <clears throat> or excuse me, I guess I should say 2022 now, uh, he, he had an immediate ceasefire and told everything to sta stay in place. He actually withdrew some forces further north into Belarusia. He was always interested in a quote-unquote agreement that would end this conflict. His principal concern was that Ukraine be neutral, not a member of the NATO alliance, and that it not be a threat to Russia. Beyond that, he wasn't terribly concerned. Well, that failed miserably. And one of the things that happened for which I don't think he and anybody else was prepared was the readiness of the Ukrainians to throw away hundreds of thousands of lives in an attempt to dislodge the Russians from the Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine that they seized fairly early. And that uh, uh, essentially absolved Putin and uh, the general staff of the responsibility to conduct a major offensive. Why attack when your opponents are willing to sacrifice themselves pointlessly in, in a direct frontal assaults on a defensive position they can't possibly take? So here we sit now in 2023. Uh, he's watching this, and I'm sure everybody there is saying, well, look, Mr. President, it's clear, we'll have to continue to advance. And they have been advancing now for a few months, albeit very slowly and very deliberately, eager for some sort of agreement to manifest itself. I think it's becoming increasingly clear that, uh, what's her name, von der Leyen, who Mercurius and his friends at Duran like to call Vander crazy, is the perfect uh, spokesman for all of this nonsense because she says, never, nothing will ever happen. We're, we'll stay to the bitter end. And that simply tells them we have no choice. We're going to have to advance yeah. to the river and we are probably going to have to advance across the river. And we may come down from Belarus at the same time and simply go into Kiev. And there isn't much to defend the place. There isn't much left of the Ukrainian armed forces. Right. And, and, and now that they're mobilizing, you know, allegedly a half a million, I, I was pointing out that the entire United States army is, is less than a lot less than 500,000 people. And you're basically saying we're going to mobilize an army of privates, 500,000 privates, which, I mean, it, it, it's the, the, the worst of all the things that they've already had because they burned away all the, the, you know, the ones that were competent the early on, the ones that were enthusiastic and actually joined and signed up. And, and I, I just can't imagine the concept and the mentality that would make anyone think that that could actually make a difference because all it's going to do is get hundreds of thousands, probably more pointlessly killed and that's just anguishing for me to imagine well i i encounter lots of people who come up to me and say 
Well, you know, CNN, NBC, CNBC, Fox News, all, all these various organizations, shows, they say this, and you're saying the opposite. Uh, why should we believe you? And I said, well, uh, do you recall someone uh, a few years ago who pointed out that most of what you were getting through the mainstream media was fake news? And they said, oh, oh yeah, who was that? I said, well, his name was Trump. He kept talking about fake news. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. They, for some reason, we compartmentalize. We simply throw overboard the lies that we were told for years and say, no, this time they're telling the truth. Yeah, this time. And there's no evidence for that. They're, they have no interest in telling the truth because the same people who are sitting in government in Washington are effectively indistinguishable from the people in the financial sector, the people that uh, you know are in the media. All of them are part of the same cabal. They have an interest in keeping this going. This is not in the interest of the American people. They could care less about us. I mean, if you just look at the vast quantities of money wasted on this, look at our open borders, look at the hundreds of thousands of people, millions at this point that have poured in. We don't know where they went. We don't know what we're going to do with them. I, I think we're going to have to remove them because we're not going to be able to afford them and, and feed them and clothe them and house them because that's where we're headed. We know we're on the verge of this bankruptcy. All of this is going to come together what I, I fear will be a perfect storm that could really rock this nation to its very foundations. But in the meantime, everybody says, the hell with it, party, more money. I mean, you saw this meeting out in Simi Valley at the Reagan Library. Uh, all of these uh, erstwhile uh, secretaries of defense showed up like Esper uh, to meet with all the current leaders in the administration. It's the uniparty. It's, it's a big dollar fest. Well, and that reminds me of something that uh, Blinken said, admitted just, wow, wide open, not even trying to hide this a uh, week or so ago. Uh, Gary, if you've got that, can you roll that up? Virtually all of the security assistance that we've provided to Ukraine, that gets invested right here in the United States. It builds our own defense industrial base. So in many ways, this, this is a win-win for us. It's it's war is a win win, Doug. That's good stuff. But yeah, a hundred thousands, hundreds of thousands of men died, and hundreds of thousands more probably will again. But dang, that's a lot of cash here. I I can't believe they even said that out loud. Well, millions of Americans who are finding it difficult to put food on the table because they can't afford to buy the food that they once did, who are watching carefully as the price of gasoline and diesel and other things continually rise as they find out that their homes that they paid a great deal of money for have now essentially dropped through the cellar. Uh, all of these and can't make their mortgage payments. All of this is going to come together in ugly ways. And Blinken can't paper over that. I mean, he could say that to his friends in the press who say, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right on, Mr. Secretary, we're with you. But the rest of the American population doesn't see it that way. Look at the polling data. Look at where these people stand in the polls. I think Americans understand this. They just haven't figured out how to get rid of them and because they've increasingly figured out we're dealing with the uniparty. And I feel badly for them, and I don't have an easy answer for them, but one thing is very, very clear. Uh, putting anybody into that White House in the fall of the next year isn't going to change a damn thing, not unless you go after everything else in the government. The bureaucracy is, is arrayed against you. It's populated people that are against us. There's no one there with an interest in us. Now, you'll hear a lone voice from time to time like Matt or a Bob Good or Rand Paul or someone, occasionally Mike Lee, but they're, they're, their voice is in the wilderness. The overwhelming majority could care less. They've got their hands out. Everybody's profiting. The only people who are not profiting are the American people. And I don't think the American people want to be dragged into a major war. If you look at the statement that came out of the White House, uh, within the last 24 hours about events in Ukraine, it reads like a declaration of war on Russia. We're, we're not prepared for a war with Russia. We're not prepared for a regional war anywhere on the planet, not in the Middle East, yeah. not in, in East Asia. And all this nonsense about China is going to, going to attack uh, Taiwan. I think a couple of years ago, I was getting these emails that said, uh, there's a big buildup and the Chinese are going to attack Taiwan. It, within the next six months. How many times have I heard that nonsense? And I keep saying there's nobody there ready to attack anybody. Nobody there wants to attack anybody. The people in Taiwan don't want a war. All of this is fictitious nonsense. But as long as you continually hear this over and over and over and over again, the more you're likely to believe it if you have no alternative to the nonsense. And right now, 
other than you and a few other people out there, there aren't very many alternatives to the nonsense. The nonsense machine, as Roger Scruton called it, continues to grind out the, this fiction every mm -hmm. single day. It does. It, 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 it is believed because that's all the, a lot of people, that's all they hear. Uh, <laughs> in, in the last section we have here, Doug, I, I want to uh, sh shift a little bit forward. Uh, and in light of all of these things that you've been talking about here economically, uh, and militarily on the ground and, and the defense capacity and all that kind of stuff, everything that I see shows that there is no chance, not a little chance, but zero chance that Ukraine would ever achieve any kind of military success. They would never drive Russia out. And with enough time, as, as I think you're arguing, that Russia will actually win and potentially go all the way up to Kiev potentially, and then actually issue a, basically a terms of surrender a negotiation instead of what they could have had many times before. So here's the big question for the United States. What are we going to do? What kind of relationship are we going to have with Russia when this is over? Now, if we had gotten a negotiated settlement and, and, and sought one like a year ago, we probably could have had one on not horrible terms, but something still OK, which would have left a free Ukraine and could have left a lot of the fiction in place. But if what you suggest does come to pass and Russia does eventually go on a large scale operation or, or at least over time gets a lot more territory, and we have to come a hat in hand, what is that going to do with our relation afterwards? Because if Russia wins and succeeds in all of these statements we just showed you from the first of the war up until you know last month, that the Western leaders are saying Putin can't win, but he does, how are we going to live with Russia? What kind of relationship are we going to have? Well, first, I think Putin is uh, privately waiting for the uh, results of elections across Europe that are increasingly moving Europe to the right and away from hostility to Russia. We've seen that in Hungary. We've seen it in Slovakia. I think we will eventually see it everywhere, including Germany. And I think his assumption is that the Europeans will ultimately figure this out and move away from it. If you just look at what they're paying in Germany now for natural gas, liquefied natural gas and oil, and you look at what they paid previously, they're now undergoing deindustrialization. They're uh, the numbers of workers that uh, skilled workers, excellent workers that were in all of these uh, industries are now on the street with no employment. None of this is sustainable. So Schultz is just going to be a distant voice in the past and, and he's going to be overtaken by events. Now, as far as Russia is concerned, we have a lot of weaknesses right now. We talked earlier about the border. We have no idea who's in this country. Every, every day I receive emails and text messages from people all over the place telling me, well, today I saw X number of young Chinese men, uh, thousands of them march into the United States and they're handed, I guess, a gift card for $5,000, plane tickets, and uh, they're off to the races. Uh, it's, it's bizarre, but that's what's going on. We're subsidizing the fragmentation and destruction of our society. We have no social cohesion. Putin is not stupid. He knows that. So I'm sure he's going to reinforce that in, in any way he can at this stage. Because in Russia, the social cohesion now is extraordinarily strong. I mean, Russian nationalism is stronger than I think it's been in 50 years. People really believe in their country and they believe in the government and they trust it. Now, are there exceptions? Of course. Yeah. But the notion that he's going to be removed from power is pure uh, fantasy. Just On fiction. the other hand, if you look at us, as I say, I think Americans are becoming increasingly skeptical. Some are outright suspicious. I see that as getting worse and worse as the economy worsens, as the financial system begins to erode and eventually collapse. And of course, everyone will say, oh, well, you know, that's not true. You said that a couple of years ago. Well, that's true. I did. I didn't tell you when it was going to happen, but it, it's, I said it was going to happen. A lot of us have. I think we're getting closer now yeah. than we've ever been in our history. And I don't see any easy way out of it. So I think Moscow and to some extent uh, Beijing are both viewing us as something that is on its way down uh, that it's spent itself into oblivion. Its forces are in ruins. I mean, just look at what we've done to the armed forces. Uh, I, I read a point the other day about the Navy surface fleet. They're so proud that we're the most diverse portion of the armed forces. Well, that's fine. Are you the most competent? Are you effective? Can you do your job? Can you accomplish the mission? 
none of those things came up. We're trying to create kind of a Brady Bunch version of America, in which case, you know, 50 plus percent are certainly people that look different from you and me. Well, that, that's nice. How does that help us? Does that improve us? Does that make us stronger? No, it absolutely doesn't. Homogeneity is critical. And if you can't create it racially, you have to have it culturally and linguistically. And we are ignoring all of those things in favor of fantasy world. Yeah, speaking Russia, of fantasy world, I mean, man. Okay, sure, go ahead. One last thing. Putin and Xi both have strategic patience. Look at how Putin has handled things in Ukraine. He doesn't want a war with the West, never has. So he's moved very deliberately and very slowly because he's not interested in suddenly giving his opponents in the West evidence for their accusations that he is some sort of belligerent, offensively minded maniac. Far from it. And Xi is the same way. He came to San Francisco. He was very straightforward. He, he outlined what are the so-called red lines for us. And then he went home. And then our friend uh, Biden stands up and says, well, he's an evil dictator, which is just absurd nonsense. China is not uh, satanic. China is not evil. China is not murdering millions of people. It's all bull. It's China. And China is different from us. And this yeah, also reminds me of something else. It reminds me of this uh, insane man named Woodrow Wilson, who, who couldn't even find legitimate grounds that he could present to the American people to declare war in Germany. And so he said, we're going to make the world safe for democracy. Well, he did the opposite, destroyed Europe and brought Bolshevism, National Socialism to power. The world was engulfed in war, largely because of his menacing influence. So we're dealing with contemporary versions of Wilsonian madness, and that's being fed to the American people. The American people need to wake up and understand how people govern themselves beyond our borders is not our affair. Well, we have to and, 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 and unfortunately, I, I, I got another clip, one more clip here that just underscores what you exactly just said, because it's all this picture you painted of what you know China's doing in their part of the world and how they're growing and getting stronger and what Putin's doing over here and how they're growing and getting stronger and how we're living in la la land. Here's what the president of the United States said uh, on the December 31st. Well, my hope is that everybody has a healthy, happy and safe new year. But beyond that, I hope that they're, they understand that we're in a better position than any country in the world to lead the world. And we're coming back and it's about time. We're coming back. It's about time. And we're the best in the world. That's his. he keeps saying that even though there's all this evidence to the contrary and we're not the best in the world, we're having troubles and we're just oblivious to it. There's no there's no sin in saying, hey, we have some faults here. Let's fix them. There is a sin in saying we have no faults. We have no sin. We're great. That's a problem for America. Yeah, the shining city on the hill is overrun with criminality, illegal migrants, as they call them and uh, governed by people who are ignoring the trash in the streets, the suffering of the American people. In other words, the shining city on the hill isn't shining anymore. It's very dim and it's very tragic. And it, it's not anything that anyone did to us. We did it to ourselves. And this business of we always have to be the first in and we always have to lead everything. This started with uh, Madeleine Albright, as you know, yeah. who was yeah. sort of uh, Wilson uh, reborn. And I think most people now know that that's not an answer, but they haven't been given a real alternative. That's the real problem. I don't see any alternative right now uh, to the Democrat Republican, you know, paradigm, which is corrupt and it's ineffective and it's the uniparty. Americans will have to deal with this, but they're not going to act, I'm afraid, Dan, until things get worse. And I don't know how much worse it can get, but historically, it always gets worse before it gets better. Yeah. I, I Just like I, I think we saw that Russia had a lot of fiction for itself. And, and, and when they started this war, they, they had a lot of internal problems that were hidden but were burned away on the battlefield. I fear that that's exactly what we have to have because until we suffer somewhere, a loss and a setback, something that can't be papered over, there's no impetus for, for any of these people who are in power, who are benefiting financially from all these things politically – to, to be replaced. And until that happens, I, we just can't get better. And unfortunately, it could get better, Doug. A lot of the things you've said, a lot of things you said in your in your organization there, which which we admire, uh, our country, our choice, you lay the foundation for a lot of this stuff that what we could do right now without having to suffer loss. But unfortunately, I don't think that the, the governing powers that be, so to speak, 
are, are going to be able to be overcome until we get burned. Yes. And, and, you know, we have to understand that our problems are here at home. They're not overseas. They're not in eastern Ukraine. They're not in the Middle East. Our problems are here. They're, they're self-inflicted. And Americans need to understand the people that have done this to them are not in Beijing or Moscow or anywhere else. They're in Washington, D.C. So on that happy note, I wish everybody a happy new year and hang in there. It's not over. And I have great confidence in this nation. I think ultimately the right people in our country will prevail. I do. If I didn't I believe do. It, I could agree I with you more, Doug. Now, but I really believe it. Yeah. Well, we are so grateful to have you and so grateful that you're, you know, carrying that banner forward to try and help those. Because I agree that there are millions of fantastic Americans who could do a great job leading this country, if only given a chance. And I pray we get that shot pretty soon. But uh, thank you very much for coming uh, on today, Doug. We look forward to having you back the next time as soon as you can get back. And for the meantime.